Welcome to the next episode of Flintco Talks. It's your boy Dano. I'm on the road for this episode. We're in Denver on the 22nd floor of the HKS office building. I'm joined here by some of my friends, Mr. Ed Smith, Miss Mackenzie McHale, and Mr. Mark Montgomery. Good afternoon. How are y'all? Doing, Doing great. great. Doing great. Mark, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you with? Why are you here today? Yeah, I'm with the WSP. We're an engineering firm um, and uh, here to talk about target value design. Ooh. Mackenzie? Mackenzie McHale. I'm with HKS. We are a global architecture firm. And uh, yeah, we're here to talk about the same thing Mark's here to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) Brother Ed? All right. So good to be here with you, Dan and Mark and Mackenzie. Uh, So Ed Smith, director with Flintco. And in my role, I'm involved with the various earliest stages of the project. Love working with owners and design teams. And personally and professionally, I'm really very passionate about TVD or uh, uh, target value design and pre-construction. Happy to talk about it with everybody today. Awesome. Well, we've got a great group here today. We've got a lot of great minds, great partners that Flinko's worked with before, and we're excited uh, to be able to talk to you all a little bit about TVD. So when we say TVD, everybody kind of has a different way to define it. Mark, do you want to start? When you hear TVD, what goes through your mind? Yeah, uh, talked about this a little bit earlier today, um, target value design or target value delivery, and I like uh, calling it delivery mm-hmm. because it's more than just design. It's uh, all-encompassing. You need a really engaged um, partners, uh, owner, um, contractor partners, um, sub-trade partners um, to really make it effective. Um, so, yeah, I think the way I would dis- uh, define it would be um, it's, it's just a, um, breaking down a project into different buckets that are managed by the different people and their experts of, of those, uh, disciplines, and then being able to effectively drive the, um, budget, mm-hmm. um, based on those buckets and then being able to, um, when we need to trade, uh, money through those buckets to keep the project on, on target. And, in the end, it's it's delivering uh, the most optimized for the budget for for the owner. Great explanation, Mackenzie. What do you think about when you hear that? I like it. TVD acronym. I like everything you said. <laughs> I would add that, and we usually say design because, of course, I'm representing the design uh, architecture and interior design, and I think that's always on our mind. I like delivery because I think that's absolutely necessary to focus on. Mm -hmm. But I I think my, the way we talk about it, my definition would be ensuring that the owner's vision is met with a very prescriptive way of defining the scope so that nothing can be lost. And and making sure, of course, that the most important thing is that it comes in at budget. Mm -hmm. Ed, you're next. Completely in sync with both of those. But being a consummate tinker, I always add a little bit to it. So I say target value design and pre-construction. I think the pre-construction is just a critical component of it to make sure we hit the targets. Um, But the approach is just exactly what uh, what McKinsey and Mark said. Um, And I like to work from the outside in, from the general to more specific, to break down a project into its major elements and then take it a little deeper and deeper so that we set small targets uh, that we can hit, that we can manage together. So when you're on a project team, We'll go back around the circle and we'll start with you, Ed, this time. Like, how often uh, do you utilize TVD on your projects uh, here at Flintco? Uh, almost every project within Flintco and the ones that I'm involved in, um, all of them. Uh, I tend to be involved in larger, more complex projects, and it really screams for this type of delivery, for a team to come together and use a collaborative, iterative process to make sure that we do hit our, hit our marks. So before we jump around and get their answers as well, why do you say larger, more complex projects? Why is that better value for those type projects? I think it's important for all projects, but the larger, more complex projects tend to have a lot of moving parts to it. Uh, a lot of places where things can go bad and use a tar- using target value approach or delivery uh, allows us to set really reasonable targets, define targets, and to work together to hit them. Uh, on smaller projects, do the same thing, but they tend to be not, again, not as complex, not as many elements to it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think it has to be scalable. I think you have to be doing it every time. I think the benefit to our owners is to remove the necessity for value engineering, which is never mm. a successful project. So if you can head that off with the intent of controlling the budget through target value and target values, I, I think that's really 
what we're going for. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it, it has to be scalable. I think I th- we do all all types of projects, but whether it's called target value design in the RFP, whether whether we're tasked with that, I think that the mentality is there in everything we do. Mark, you're nodding your head. Tell me what's on your mind. Yeah, I think uh, um, I would say that all of our major projects and major, I mean, you know, scale, uh, all of our complex projects, and we we focus on um, healthcare, science and technology, and and commercial mixed use type projects, and so. Um, almost all of our major projects are going uh, TVD and, uh, um, you know, value engineering is a dirty word. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it doesn't add value nope. and it's not engineering. Um, and uh, so it's, it's waste is what it is. And, you know, when we're really trying to drive our industry um, and drive waste out of our industry, that's a good place to really focus is time is, is wasted um, money's wasted. And then I think in the end, TVD type of delivery is really, um, maximizing that program and making sure that we're having those conversations in a roadmap to tell the story on how we got to what we got to, um, in the end. And I think uh, the benefit to the owner is that they know that they are spending their money where they want their money spent. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure all of us have had projects that we've worked on where you're like, they spent money on that, but we ve this, right. you know, that kind of stuff. And I've had those experiences where an owner was really upset at the end of a project when they had to value engineer out one of their major programmatic elements and then in the end got the amount of money back on the, the contract Ooh. that they could have put that into the project. That's, that's a, that's a major miss, you know, that's a failure at every level. And so this TVD approach is trying to drive that out. And so that we know when we're making those decisions in real time, um, that we're making them, uh, in the right direction for what the owner wants in the end. So many good talking points there, Mark. I really appreciate what you brought to the table. What I'm hearing is like stewardship, right? When you think of the word stewardship, when you think of, uh, I think of my dad, like giving me 20 bucks and telling me like, Hey, you have to use this for the week and be a good steward of the money that I'm blessing you with. And how do I take care of it to get through the week and make sure that I can buy my lunch and have money to put in the offering plate on Sunday and take my girlfriend to the movies. Okay. Maybe it'd be like 50 bucks in today's time, (laughs) but, um, so I wanted to go back and let's, let's talk about, um, your process of engagement for you, Mackenzie, like when, when y'all are starting on a project and you said, Hey, we're definitely doing TVD on here. What's the first things that come to your mind and how you get your team ready? It's all about relationships and it's all about alignment. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter the team, and I think uh, whether you're talking about HKS's design team internally or um, the AEC team, you know, globally, I think you have to somehow establish a relationship if it's not there already. And usually, y- usually it is. Usually, the partners you select are for a reason. It's because you have this trust, this foundation that you'll build um, this project on. It, it's it's about trust and knowing that. Everyone has a voice, and you mentioned um, as as you look granularly at each of the buckets that you've got the right experts leading those discussions and making sure that the thought leadership is there to to really challenge the process and to really be critical, critical thinking throughout the entire process. And to be able to do that successfully from, from the very beginning all the way through construction, you've got to start with some kind of alignment, um, conversations, collaboration, discussions, team gatherings, mm-hmm. you know, in-person um, meetings, those kinds of things to discuss everyone's role and, and make sure that everything, everyone's got buy-in. I love what you said about everybody has a voice. I feel like sometimes the best ideas come from the least likely people in the room and by allowing somebody to be able to speak up really can change the change the way the project's going to go or the design's going to go um mark for you what do you what do you think about when you're saying hey we're getting teed up on a tvd job and i know that mckenzie probably hit some of yours but what are other things you think of 
Yeah, some of the things I think of are um, when are we going to bring in the trade partners Mm -hmm. and at what stage um, and who are they going to be? Um, I, I think, uh, it, you know, this business always has been and, and always will be about relationships. Mm-hmm. And so you've got a kind of short list of people in your mind, um, that you're like, Hey, I want to make sure that these people are on the, the invite list, um, to be in the conversation on this project because I trust them and I know that they're going to have my back when we get into the trenches together. So mm-hmm. absolutely. Ed, I see you nodding your head over there. What are yeah. you thinking? Well, they're both right on target. And you, you mentioned uh, McKenzie in person. I like the first meeting to be in person. We've yeah. gotten very good at holding uh, virtual meetings and being very efficient that way, but there's nothing like being in a room face-to-face. Uh, it allows you to draw out more information, draw someone out that might not uh, be willing to speak out or just not comfortable with it to make sure that we're hearing everything, that we have people that are being transparent, their voice is heard, and begin to set the not only the 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 targets the the values themselves but the overall goals for the project so that they're w- very well defined and we all agree upon them no uh, silent disagreement right and that's where being in the room the first time i think is very important uh working virtually after that some works works very well but that first meeting and then charrettes that we use after that nothing like being in person in a room together when you think about uh, being in person, I heard you say we've gotten very good at Zoom meetings. I, if you look at my calendar today, it's probably 17 <laughs> Zoom meetings this week. Right, yeah. Like I can't agree more with getting the right people in the room. I think about a design build project that I did de- during the height of COVID. And we're trying to have these conversations over the phone, right? And we get to the end of the job and there's somebody that walks in and it's like, well, that's not what I expected. It's like, mm-hmm. well, all I could see was your face in a two by two box on my computer. So I didn't know you were disagreeing with what we were talking about. So I love the in-person, the in-person yeah. part and how, uh, how that plays in. So Mackenzie, back to some of the things that you were talking about a second ago, you said really the critical thinking aspect and having the right experts in the room. What value does that bring to the, the process for you? I think within each of the buckets, and, and usually I'm, I'm speaking to sustainability and siting the building mm-hmm. and massing, and, and you know, I, I, have a, I have a narrow view of where that has the greatest impact for, for what I'm looking at. Um, you know, I, I think pulling levers mm-hmm. in terms of understanding what that vision is uh, for each of my owners, because the, no two projects are the same. There is no real standard for quality of design. So you have to have a a very good understanding of, are we talking about something that's meant to be very iconic? What Mm. kind of impact are we making in the community? Um, You know, from from a design aspect, what do you want to do? How flexible um, is your master plan? How how can we set you up for successes down the road for uh, conversions? We know that that happens. Renovations. Um, You know, we we look at the upfront cost that can be there, and that's a strategy, mm-hmm. to ensure that there's cost savings later on down the road. I know Mark will tell you that mechanical is the biggest you know, <laughs> investment that an owner will have. Right. Uh, the, the operation of the building is where we should really be focusing those cost savings. And it, it may come with a premium, but we have the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, in design to to be able to expand our buildings and change them functionally down the road um, 20 years from now, um, setting them up for successes in, in, in how they're built, their business will grow. Absolutely. Mark, I want to come back to something you said a minute ago about when to get trade partners involved, right? We're just talking about experts, mm-hmm. trade partners involved. I know Ed's going to have something to say here, but for you, what's the what's the right time? You know, um, I like them to be on board uh, at the very latest, um, right at the beginning of design development, Um, Mm -hmm. but ideally more in kind of that early schematic design uh, um, level because schematic design is still trying to get your budget right and get the scope right and all that kind of stuff. And um, there's not a lot on paper yet. Mm-hmm. Um, the stakes are low in terms of the time to peel things back, or that's the time that we need to be throwing things at the wall and see what sticks. Right. And so 
um, multiple instances in my career where I've had great ideas from trade partners come up that didn't even wasn't even in the conversation. Mm. And those are the times you really want to explore those right. and and put some numbers to it mm-hmm. and say, hey, you know what? We, we have a project that uh, McKinsey and I are working on now where we have a budget that um, was earmarked for sustainability and, mm-hmm. and some of that was earmarked for the envelope. Mm-hmm. And so we got into the energy modeling phase of the project and realized, well, gosh, uh, any more envelope improvements past uh, a certain point is really diminishing returns. Mm. And so let's maybe move some of those, that bucket of money from the envelope earmark into the mechanical earmark because the 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 slice of the pie of the energy usage is way higher after a certain amount. Mm-hmm. You always want to do uh, you w- always want to maximize your what we call passive strategies. So mm-hmm. your envelope is a passive strategy, and then you go to the active strategies. And so w- in this particular project, we found that it was very heavily ventilation driven. It's a healthcare project, so we know that it's going to be heavily ventilation driven and in this climate zone it's always mm-hmm. going to be heating driven sure and so we found that energy recovery for that amount of money was a way better use of the owner's dollars than putting more insulation in the walls or on the roof at some point it's just diminishing returns we're we're fighting uh, uh, to try and get one or two percent more energy savings which by the way is maybe 20 grand a year Right. It's not that much. Yeah. It's not going to move the needle. Yeah. Right. But if you take a look at that and, and attack the ventilation strategy, then it's like, you know, 40%. Right. That's back to the stewardship component. Exactly. As well, right. Making sure you have the right value set. Ed, what were you going to say about trade partners <laughs> yeah, and involvement? So, so I agree with Mark. Generally, the earlier, the better, but it does depend. It depends on the project and it depends yeah. on the trade. Yeah, um, like, that's right. By way of example, on a hospital, drywall is important. It's a big part of it, but mm-hmm. we might not need to bring them on early. Right. Conversely, the systems or uh, the skin of the building, curtain wall, um, a project that I'm involved in now, a very large project, has 31 elevators. So we made the decision to bring on the elevator company in the very first package that we put out yeah. so that the structure could be designed around the specific elevator manufacturer. So we need to look at those type of things, you yeah. know, specific to the project. But generally, the earlier the better. But yeah, no later than uh, SD on critical systems. Yeah. So when, we're, when we get the job and you, you're looking at the OPR or whatever the document is, and, and you kind of see the requirements from the owner. Ed, how do, you, how do you start that process to say, hey, these are the dollar amounts that we're going to try to assign to each of the different buckets that Mark was talking about here a minute ago? Yeah, so even before we start to assign the numbers, I want to make sure that we have the right buckets. Right? So I'm going back yeah. to that and how we're going to break up Ooh. the project, how it's going to be designed. Um, there might be multiple parts of the project where there's separate design teams. So we may want to uh, break it up by those buckets. The owner may have... Uh, certain financial accounting uh, things that they need to uh, you know need us to account for so I just like to ask question after question after question um, and draw out more information it's not on paper yet doesn't need to be on paper we're not there yet but the more that we just ask questions to better understand then we can start to to, uh, first establish what those buckets are right so as I said we start from general and move from the outside in and get more and more detailed so we'll look at do we need to break this project up into three maybe major elements and then within that I like to use uniform and break it down into systems it's a way that we design the way that we think as a builder right foundations substructure structure of the building envelope the building systems then the interiors and then take and break it down even more than that or we do uh, for uh, pre-construction purposes to CSI uh, phase really into the detail. And the reason for that is that if we set the target too big, the scope too big, um, it's not gonna be very well defined and we're not gonna hit it. So the more that we can refine it, uh, by way of example, the mechanical systems, we wouldn't say the mechanical systems are gonna be you know, $30 million. We would break it down into air handling units, right? Duck work, uh, building automation system controls, right? So we begin to break it down into more finite pieces like that. Even in the initial session, we'll talk about those because it's really critically important to get the buckets established so we track it right from the beginning. So it'll meet the needs of construction, design, as well as the owner. It also provides predictability, right? Absolutely. As you're you're looking at each line item in the budget, it's really easy to look and and, and you'll know why the electrical number went up this time Mm -hmm. or why the architectural number went up this time. And you can pinpoint it, circle back to the vision and say, 
this was part of the vision, right? This was the the yeah. one thing, the must have, we got to maintain that, right? Is it time to move some money from this bucket to that bucket to make yeah. sure it's, uh, make sure it's maintained? Mackenzie, right. when we break, when we break something down, like Ed was just talking about, uh, are you always trusting of Ed and his numbers or do you have your own <laughs> sure. historical data you'd want to look at? Sure. No. No, <laughs> we know who our experts are. <laughs> no, we do trust. Right uh, answer. That, that's that is the reason why we look for the right partner. Um, having the right expertise, the right voices in the room, mm-hmm. uh, that that really speaks to that. You know, what you've got is strategy, and what I've learned from our uh, contractors and our and our engineers as well. There's um, architecture has to respond to some of the m- the most significant um, components of the building. Let's take mechanical. You know, if if in a target value design situation, you have earmarked uh, mechanical dollars and have broken that down, and you know that one of the systems is out of line with what maybe our expectations are, we know we can do better. That's where innovation comes in. We are right. able to detect where the failures are and to improve line by line, and then follow that. Make, make, sure, make sure that the savings are are real and um, and p- perhaps you know there's a strategy to circumnavigate some of that by early release packages and, and getting those and I, being able to identify which of the equipment can be bought out sooner than later you know to avoid escalation perhaps or challenges in, in actually getting that to the site later and then the architecture can respond to that instead of you know we're all just siloed and we're all just trying to do the best here. It's um, it should be a very collaborative approach. Yeah, I like how you uh, described how you break down the the project into buckets because it really mimics not only the design process and how we design buildings, but it also kind of groups those with uh, experts. And so the you know I. I I'm not an expert in envelope and shouldn't be in any of those conversations about the envelope of the building, <laughs> but uh, keeping myself in in my expertise, but being able to understand what the envelope is trying to do so that I can make sure that my systems are aligned with that. And so that's 100% how I think about design and the whole process is, okay, what are we trying to get to first? And then where are the priorities a lot of our early design conversations are all about what are the priorities of the owner what it was what success look like Mm -hmm. and so that we can define that and then measure ourselves later and so i feel like the the whole tvd process aligns to that and kind of helps us in a more natural way than just going okay we all go to our own uh, separate buildings do our thing and then we come back at a couple different milestones and see how far we've drifted right. you know so. well and that's yeah that's the uh, value engineering right when things go bad when you don't monitor it in between yeah. major milestones things do go bad typically right. so it's yeah. that constant interaction the iteration uh, the check-ins when it when uh, tvd becomes part of the vernacular of the project team it works when you have uh, an engineer calling up say hey ed what do we have in for this what do you think about that mm-hmm. right so you're checking in all the time sometimes i think about it um, like a swimmer in a 200 meter uh, freestyle right we all dive into the pool at the same time and then maybe take four strokes and you come up for air and more strokes and you come up for air those are the check-ins. When we go to do the flip, the turn, that's a major milestone in design and we're pricing it, right? Yeah. But we don't stop swimming and you don't stop designing. So we have to be talking all the time, right? So it, because it's constantly in motion, the design, which means we have to be talking all the time about the target budgets and are we in sync? Are we hitting them? Yeah. I was just about to ask you that is how often do we have to look at it, right? That was the question I just written down because yeah. you talked about detecting failures, McKenzie, and that's one of the things that if maybe... I'm not going to take a breath till I get to the first turn. Do you think I'm going to have some failures in my in my bucket allowance at, at, at the first milestone? I think you will. I th- <laughs> Absolutely. You, you might sink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might pass out. Let's be yeah. honest. I haven't swam in a long time. But um, um, I, yeah. I, I really so, like what you said about that. It's a, it's a really good analogy to think about. It's like you have to come up every now and then. Uh, we as contractors have to be willing to take the call, yeah. right? And as designers, y'all have to be willing to make the call or be able to provide the feedback, right? So it's all the way back to this, the right relationship, right? And having the right, um, the community amongst the team 
that comes from the in-person meetings. It comes from the conversations. It comes from the conditions of satisfaction. We love to do a conditions of satisfaction mm -hmm. kind of charter at the beginning yeah. of every job. Help establish a vision. What does success look like? You said that just a, sec a second ago. How can we define success for this job and uh, really make sure that when we're all done, everybody's standing here going, this is exactly what I wanted. Yeah. It's going to serve the purpose of my people. It's going to serve the purpose of the people that are going to be in this building, uh, whatever we're looking for. And that we want to do it again together, together. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. That's the, that's one of the key items too. That's always <laughs> at the bottom on the contractor <laughs> side for the conditions of satisfaction is be on the owner's, uh, you know, good list, not be yeah. on the naughty list when the project's over. Um, was there anything else that y'all wanted to talk about in that? It seemed like that was a really good. Uh, well, you, you asked about the uh, the frequency, and I would say for design team members, the frequent frequency of check in varies, right? But for us, it's almost daily, right? Because we're interacting with diff different design team members, different frequencies. So that is almost every day that we're looking at, uh, you know, giving feedback on a design element or a ROM number on something, right? And that's the way that it works: is that con constant interaction and iteration of numbers. Now it's a heavy lift, uh, but it's worth doing, and that's how it works. Well, it, it's fluid. That's right. And I think it is continuous, and it's that rhythm you're talking about with the swimmers. I um, I, I think it's the same as picking up the phone. I mean, it doesn't have to be a Zoom call. It doesn't have to be something Amen. structured. Yeah, <laughs> amen to that. <laughs> hey, I just found something. We're yeah. thinking about doing this. Sure. What is that? What impact does that have on our bottom line? Is there a better way to do it? I mean, let's play 20 questions. We, we can get to right. this. We can get to the answer yeah. and and check a bunch of boxes for everyone at the table. Yeah, and even having the trade partner input as well, right? Because sometimes they might know of a different system or they might know of a different avenue to try to accomplish something that gets the right That's right. The right cooling load taken care of or the right heat load taken care of that, that helps everybody and is not even in um, not even of our realm of possibility for here. So Yeah, a lot of times we see great innovation come from just the procurement. You know, mm -hmm. they know who's going to be the one that we can get on time or the one who's, you know, uh, got the better pricing out there and those sorts of things. And so we can design to that manufacturer. Mm -hmm. You know, the, one of the biggest frustrations uh, in in the design community is, OK, we're designing this. We have to pick a specific something, but we are keeping it open for procurement and keep it competitive. And then, you know, it's all we joke in the design community, like, well, if you want to be on the job, you don't want to be listed as the specified <laughs> manufacturer because yeah. guaranteed you're not going to be the right. one that gets used. Right. And so um, we joke about that a lot, but it, it's almost, uh, uh, you know, the 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 poison. Uh, and so that that makes a big difference for us because, OK, now we know that. XYZ manufacturer is who is going to be the best and we've already got them locked in. Right. And so now we can design around that because if we don't, then that's an RFI later. How many times have we said, okay, we've designed an air handler, we've bought a different one and the electrical connections are slightly different. Right. It's every job. And yeah. so it's a risk to the job. It's a bucket that ends up being contingency and those sorts of things. But if you can mitigate that risk early on in design, we're all about it. It's just, it makes everybody's job easier and it's less waste because it takes everybody doing it twice when, when we do it differently. So. Right. And I think Mackenzie alluded to that earlier when you said that the values are real, right? When you think mm -hmm. about what the value is of this specific scope and maybe something changes, you're like, oh, it's a $10,000 savings for this, but nobody ever goes back and looks at the connection. That's right. And all of a sudden the electrician's pulling yep. wire up there and they're like, oh. That's right. Yeah, the mechanical guy and, and in a, the, the old world, old school kind of way of doing things, hey, you buy out the, and, you know, create your margin by, you know, buy out and try and really, um, get the best thing for the mechanical, and that might save five thousand dollars over here and cost fifty thousand over here. Mm -hmm. And then everybody looks at everybody in the room and says, "That's a failure." Um, so, 
the more that we can drive those things out and we have to have the trade partners there because Absolutely. they're the, they're the ones that are in conversation with the market to be able to actually make those procurements. And, and sometimes they have such a great relationship with purchasing power that that makes a huge difference mm -hmm. to the owner um, in pricing and, you know, responsiveness, all sorts of things. It's, it's super powerful. That is, that is just spot on. Um, take air handling units for an example, right? That varies over time, which manufacturers might be more competitive and it varies by market. It varies by region. Yep. And so making those selections early for that specific project for that market will let, let you um, get the best value. And, and not doing that, there are a lot of downstream effects, negative effects. Exactly. Um, yeah. As you know, we mentioned, electrical can affect structure, yeah. so many different yeah. things. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think back to a project that we did, I don't know, 10 years ago in Austin, and it was a design build. It was a chilling station, and uh, it was a 15,000-ton station. It was going to be unmanned. Well, the OPR said it all needed to be air-conditioned, and we started saying, hey, why are we not going to do this? And I was talking directly to the – mechanical guy and we ended up coming back with this huge credit and thank the lord that the electrician was sitting in that next meeting going through the list of hey what are savings opportunities and we said we can save this much money if we don't condition the first floor and the owner says oh my gosh this is such a great idea and the electrician says hold on you know my conductor size is going to have to increase right it's going to be warmer in the space and all of a sudden it's like it's a good thing we didn't put that one on the log yet, right? It's a good thing yeah. that we didn't account for that. And, and all of a sudden, yeah. everybody was in the room. We could diagnose the issue right away. And the electrical yeah. engineer says, great, let me go back, and I can make do some calcs and figure out what the conductor size is now. And, hey, it's not the savings we thought it was, but it's still worthy of looking at. So We as designers are really good at uh, making great ideas expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to look at the uh, potential unintended consequences, right? Yeah, um, yeah so absolutely. It, it's, it's having that, that yeah. conversation, yeah. digging deep. So when circling back on how often do we look at this, when, you know, typically we have owners that bring us on on a, a seam at risk type project, and it's very prescriptive about we have an estimate at 100% SDs and 50% DDs. Right. Is there an increased uh, drawing review or uh, release? Would you say, Ed, is that is that beneficial or is it? Um, not an increased drawing release. It's mm -hmm. really not about that, about having uh, the design team stop and print, right? We So we still use the major milestones uh, for a printing, and it's always good to do that, have a check set and really put eyes on it. But uh, we're able to look typically in the model, right? And so we're having virtual meetings and looking at a model. We have people in, uh, even early on beginning BIM coordination, looking, try to identify some potential clashes or, or problems. So um, it doesn't have to be the physical print to stop and print. And that, I mean, that's, a, that's kind of a killer for design team, right? That's a, that's a big task. Yeah, it can, be, it can be a lot of effort. And if it's not being... Uh, if it's not helping the project move forward, then, um, you know, I, I think on big projects, it makes sense to have maybe a, you know, 50% DD and DD and then 50% CD mm -hmm. and CD. Um, but on smaller projects where we're doing that and then in three weeks we're we're doing the 100%. Yeah. There, yeah. No I sense mean, in doing that, right? It's There's really not enough right. time to actually react to it and help dr steer the ship. And so I think sometimes we can just get uh, programmed into checking boxes mm -hmm. and uh, not really think about the value of yeah. it. Yeah, contract says we have to do this, so we're yep. going to do it, right? That's exactly yeah. right. So Ed talked about looking in the model. How do y'all feel about, you know, sharing models throughout design and, and letting guys like us look through them and try to determine quantities, that kind of stuff? Um, I think, uh, you know, having the conversations early so that we know how to set up the model and mm -hmm. those sorts of things and expectations and make sure yeah. that it aligns with the contract. Cause sometimes we've been asked for a lot of stuff that's right. You know, significant amount of time, sure. but, but in general, I would say, you know, I, I don't think there's a, a project I've done in this method that we haven't laid out the electrical rooms and send uh, those to the electrician and said, mm -hmm please take a look at these right. and tweak them because now's the time to do it. Super easy. And they're going to come up with things that we just don't think about right. how the conduit bends into this and that and the other. And, and they come up with a superior deal. And then, so essentially by the time you're at CDs, you have a, a, a an as built document mm -hmm. because they're going to build off of it that way. That's, 
that's the goal. And I think um, we welcome that input. And, and, you know, a lot of times we're pretty good about having those conversations to say, hey, just so you know, we're in iteration mode. Don't worry about what's in the model the next few weeks because we're playing with some things. Right. Yep. You know, and that's and that's always gone very well. They're like, OK, you know, we're not going to send you 25 questions on Tuesday right. morning. <laughs> Um, because you saw us playing around in the model. So we, we do a pretty good job of saying, hey, we're going to be playing around here, and then, hey, we're ready for you guys to really take a look at this and give us some ideas. So I was going to say the same thing. It, the, the only danger there is, and it goes back to relationship, what's, what's the expectation when we stop, drop, and print? It's usually for our process prints. Uh, it's for coordination. And we're good at knowing that there's probably two or three design iterations in there that we're either testing or considering still. And so handing that over could could be confusing. It right. it might yeah. it's misinformation right. in some mm-hmm. cases. Um, it's not a very clean model uh, for a lot of the first uh, initial design phases. So we um, you know we we do that. We welcome that certainly. I think it's a it needs to be a controlled effort. I, right. I think it's a more of a coordination tool, um, and and it deserves conversation. Agreed. Yeah, and I think what goes along with that too is things just in, it's all about communication again, where, um, hey, we talked about this two weeks ago. How come it's not updated yet? Well, we're not working on that part of the project right now. We're kind of doing these other things. And, and what I love about the TVD, the, the early design phase is a lot of it is just spending time studying things mm, and going, yeah. hey, mm-hmm. let's run this idea to ground. Let's Let's run this idea to the ground. Let's put an ROI to all of this stuff. And it really gives us tons of experience um, that you wouldn't get until the building was built otherwise. And so we're getting to really spitball this thing out a little bit further with quick. I mean, we're not holding anybody to any dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just doing comparative dollars so Mm -hmm. we can say, oh, is this a payback or is it not a payback? And and. uh, um, that's what I love about it is you really can test a lot of things quickly and within a week or so, you know, you've got the answers and say, okay, yeah, we're not exploring that. And sometimes that can take, it can linger months if you're not got everybody in sync and, and having weekly check-ins and you have that other person who's responsible for that component engaged and there at the table. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I, lo- I love that. Uh, and we love playing the what ifs, right? To do it early. <laughs> what ifs and then run yeah. ROM numbers or That's rough right. order magnitude to test yeah. out different solutions and to do it early. Yeah. I'd uh, really then set the course. Something else that we like to do as part of uh, target value design and pre construction are charrettes. In person charrettes, where we have very focused meetings where you're focused on a, a certain issue or set of, um, set of issues and work for solutions, right? So we have done it on the large project that I mentioned. We've had 10 for the building facade. And then ultimately we rolled in uh, superstructure. So we called it the building facade and superstructure charrette. And we had everybody in a room literally working through details, even before the shop drawings uh, had started and, and before design was complete. And it's such a positive way to do it, to have those focus charrettes. We've also done it on MPE systems, right? So you're working a lot out a lot of uh, potential issues, I should say, not necessarily issues, but uh, potential issues. And uh, we just find it's a very positive way to do it. Those I think are better in person get people gathered up in a room so the yeah. frequency is less yeah. mm-hmm. uh, less often but very very powerful tool but you're you're kind of solving those problems before they become problems that's right, right. that's, that's right. the idea yeah. what oh. were you going to say awareness oh, oh yeah I, I would say some of our charrettes and we, we use the same word um, I think just making sure everyone's on the same page for um, floor to floor heights no fly zones yeah. Yeah. oh yeah yeah. yeah you know those the, there's <laughs> a lot Ceiling of savings heights. Right to be had, yeah. and uh, depending on the function of each floor, there's some play there that could be potential cost savings, right. major cost yes. savings. So some of those kinds of charrettes with all of the all of the folks who would have buy-in on the building structure and the in the building systems need to be present to yeah. to help guide that conversation. We don't do that in a silo. So uh, yeah, that those are the kinds of things I think I heard when when you're talking about you know that kind of collaboration. One of the things, Mark, you said a few minutes ago was TVD gives you the opportunity to drive waste out. And I want to talk about that for a little bit. When you said drive waste out, there was a hundred things that went through my mind about 
what that actually means. Let, let's let's dive into that a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, um, waste in my mind is time. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a that you know that's probably the biggest one. Mm-hmm. And and uh, um, then uh, you know things like okay we we made a decision, but now we have to go back and make a decision again. Um, so you're you're kind of double dipping there. Sometimes you end up buying more or less. Uh, than you need to, um, and that that's pretty common for us as well, um, and uh, you know just the unknowns. I think mm-hmm. a, a lot of times, as an engineer, you're kind of uh, forced into well, what's worst case, right. okay? And mm-hmm. then if if those decisions aren't made at the right time, then that just carries further and further and further through, and then before you know it, you've got systems that are oversized or those sorts of things um, for the what if scenario and we haven't really driven out some of that uh, and then as a result uh, we carry too much money in that bucket that could have saved some other features for the project that we really wanted but had to um, concede on so in in my mind that's that's what comes to my mind or what I mean when I say waste it's it, most of the time it's it's time and just redoing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, um, you know, sometimes it's actually in the material at the end. Right. Yeah. Know, very, what, what very real construction with? cost. You're right. right. That's dead on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that waste could be labor in that time. I, I see it as labor, just doing something twice, three times. Mm-hmm. I think that actually increases the chance for errors and omissions Mm -hmm. as a designer you think you've already figured that out you think you've already coordinated that thing well the downstream effects of (laughs) unintended consequences um come back to bite um it is it comes from a little bit of fatigue having been through it and um certainly we're, we're we're very well versed in doing that but there is some risk there that we have to constantly be aware of you bring up a great point, Mackenzie. Uh, my good friend Sarah that you and I were talking about earlier, uh, she did a study for us, and this is probably like 20 years ago, mm-hmm. and um, where where do we make the most mistakes on projects? And it, it was astounding to see that if we're drawing things and then changing and redrawing things and changing and redrawing things, that is where we make mistakes. And it's also out of order sometimes too. So if yeah. you are doing things uh, that you did in schematic design, but you're doing it back in construction documents well down the road, McKinsey brought up that point. It's excellent. That's your brain has already moved past that. Right. It's it's out of order. It's out of sequence. And so you don't go through the same thinking process. Right. It's already been vetted, right? That's right. Right. And so uh, an example, one time, you know, uh, hey, just just move this. You know, how many times (laughs) have we said that to each other? (laughs) Right. It's just this. And so you go to whoever's actually doing that work and say, it's just this, do this. And they're just myopically focused on, okay, I'm just doing that. I check that task off, move on. And nobody steps back and goes, wait a second, this starts to domino other things. That was the correlation on that and drawing things too much is definitely one of the biggest risks for designers is mm-hmm. that, that that's, that's the reason why we make mistakes in almost every case. Conceptually, we're almost always nailed on, down. We're, we're fine conceptually. Mm-hmm. It's those little details that we did it right when we drew it in DD, you know, because I spend a lot of my time going, how do we, how did we make this mistake? Right. And I go back through our documentation and we do a pretty good job of documenting that. And almost always we can uncover the, oh, and then you go talk to that person and, and uh, the light bulb is, Oh gosh, I just handed that off to so and so and gave them this direction. And they I just moved it. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. And then it's oh my, look at how much money that cost everybody in the end because we just moved something and we didn't actually go through the full thinking process that we did when we placed it the first time. 
Yeah. Mark, I think there's another place where TBD drives out waste, and that's when we get to construction, and it has to do with RFIs, yeah. right? I mean, that can be a big time-consuming process. Yeah. And I find that when we use TBD and do it right, that we have fewer and less significant RFIs and fewer change orders, right? Mm-hmm. Because we're, we're solving so much together up front. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, a lot of RFIs is I don't understand what we're trying to do here. Let's right. sort this out. And, and those are, you know, important RFIs, but we've already got that covered if we're shoulder to shoulder in DD. That's one of the big benefits early on for owners, also designers and the contractors. You have those conversations when it is just paper or it is just... Right. In the model, it, it's easy to move something. It's not yeah. we're building something and we're just going to mm-hmm. slide this over right. a little bit and you end mm-hmm. up in a big problem. But, I mean, the RFIs, they're tough for us at being assigned to a job site right yeah. now. And we've got RFIs and, you know, the designer's like, oh, my gosh, you keep asking us questions. And we're like, <laughs> we're still trying to figure out what we're doing, right? It's, it was a rushed mm-hmm. process. And mm-hmm. um, I love thinking about TVD and how it relates to accountability for everybody. It's no longer just on the designer. It's no longer just on the owner. It's no longer just on us. It's, hey, we're a team. We're going to get in the boat together, and let's let's paddle this way, and let's make sure that we can make the right decisions. What you said earlier about designing a system for worst-case scenario, and all of a sudden the building opens, and the building manager calls and says, this is the least efficient building I've ever had in my <laughs> life. Why is our electric bill so much? And you're like... Well, we designed the worst case and we never we never circled back. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever okay. came back and said, is this the right way to do it? So I love the thought of being at, even all in the pool at the same time, yeah. swimming the same 200 meters and we're getting to the turn at the same time and we're all going to break Michael Phelps' record right at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great way to hold each other accountable, right? I think when everybody has skin mm-hmm. in the game, everybody buys into it, then it's easier to, I won't say call each other out, but ask questions, right? Challenge each other in a very constructive way. Um, just I, a very positive way to do it. I think, um, you know, when I first started in the industry 26 years ago. Last um, century? Yeah. Is that, okay, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, yes. Um, <laughs> um, so it there was some ego uh, involved and I, at least from my chair, I observed it, you know, if you were a good engineer, you kind of had some swagger to you and those sorts of things. And, and ego is an obstacle to most things in, in, in all reality. And so, and no more is it uh, more true than in the construction trailer and in the, the design meetings. And so, you know, target value delivery kind of crushes that. And, and I think it's a good thing. I, you know, nobody has this, uh, Hey, it's my way or the highway kind of thing. It's my specification. Nobody mess with it. Um, it's really, um, it drives that out very quickly. And, uh, you know, I, I've found myself gravitating to those preferred partners that, uh, carry that same kind of thinking, Hey, you know, set, check, yeah. check your ego at the door. It has no place here. So what's well, an opportunity for everybody to learn also. Yeah. Right. And we talked about that at lunch today, talking about how COVID has played an impact on people just being able to meet in person yep. and overhear conversations and learn. But if everybody's in the same room and the egos are checked at the door, mm-hmm. it's an excellent opportunity for yeah. everybody to get smarter and only everybody can benefit if we're all smarter, right? Yeah. I mean, how are we not going to do something awesome with this brain power in the room? Mm-hmm. As long as somebody doesn't come in there with a black cape and start waving it around and you end up, you know, uh, subjugating to whatever that person says rather than, hey, I think differently and I, w- I want to have a voice here too. Um, that's that's how we get the best uh projects. Yeah. And I think we all genuinely want to help each other and TBD opens that up, right? Yeah, so we're not totally. only holding each other accountable, but we're really helping each yeah. other. So we all are successful. Yeah. Yep. Right. Accountability at every level only yeah. helps everybody, right? That's right. Good at communication. Were you going to say something about that a second ago? Oh, I, I was nodding. I, I like all the things. <laughs> I, like all, yeah. I, I would say <laughs> my, uh, my abilities as an architect are directly proportionate to the amount of input and leadership and education and mentorship I have received from contracting um, relationships with the contractors and my engineers. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, those are the best partners. Those are the best projects. And I think that my ability to coordinate a building comes from the understanding of how to put a building together for constructability and um, code, certainly. But outside my own discipline, are, are a lot, it's, a, it's a vast amount of knowledge on every project that never I can never know. So even 22 years in, I'm still learning. Mm-hmm. And, and if you've got the right partners. And it keeps changing. I mean, changing. that's uh, you're never that's bored right. in this industry. If if you are, you're doing it wrong, right? Uh, for sure, because it's it, it's ever evolving. What was every day? This is how you do something five years ago. It is not true anymore. Mm-hmm. Changes so quickly. Yeah, uh, it does. Uh, the codes change, right? Materials mm-hmm. change. Equipment yeah. changes. Yeah. Um, Construction methods change. You know how uh, equipment that you can acquire is different. You know, it's yeah, it's. It's, it's actually a really exciting time. Um, you know, codes a lot of times will drive the need for innovation and, and uh, you know, very true here in Denver, Colorado, where they've set Energize Denver and, and they're, they're pushing uh, building owners to operate at a energy use intensity level that is a very high bar. And so that is not only driving innovation from a design perspective, but it absolutely drives the manufacturers Mm -hmm. of the technologies that you need available to you to be able to attain those those goals and so it's a very exciting time right now in that regard because uh things that we're applying to a project that mckinsey and i are working on right now didn't even exist five years ago and so in five years we're going to be applying something completely different and so you know mckinsey referenced you know trying to future proof buildings and right. no more uh, important is that than now really because things are changing so quickly how people use buildings and the technology and how's the AI going to change that and how's autonomous vehicles going to change it things like a parking garage might end up needing to be clinical space at some point mm-hmm. or it's throwaway waste um, and so you know instead of putting that in a landfill it's figure out how that's supposed to look in 10, 15 years. That's the stuff that's exciting to me right now. One of the things, Mackenzie, you said a few minutes ago was about removing the necessity for VE. I wanted to circle back to that, and I wanted to dive into that a little bit and see when you said that, like I could see like the twinkle in your eye that you're super passionate about it. So tell us a little bit about removing that necessity for... Removing VE. Well, I think... For, and it's, it's, it's commonplace to start to talk about value engineering as, a, as a, its own phase, like it deserves a place in our projects. Mm. And we, all, we always fear it because we know that it will deplete the outcomes. It will deplete our design. It will, it's not what we sold as our quality of work. And we know from experience that it also means that the building that was planned is not going to function the way it was intended. And, you know, for everybody involved, it just, it doesn't have that, that gold standard of success attached to it. There's, there was some failure and we did what we could with the time that was left and it came in at the last minute and it was, it feels like a scramble and it doesn't, it just doesn't have to be that way. I, I don't think we have to make those uh, accommodation. Com- completely agree. I stopped using the term years ago because as Mark said, it add, uh, it's, doesn't add value and it's not engineering, right? And it, it's planning for failure, right? Planning to go wrong. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I just, I stopped doing it. Um, let's, let's plan for success. Let's use the tools that we have available. Let's collaborate, you know, and, uh, and we end up with a much better product, much happier owner, much better uh, overall experience. Uh, but yeah, I just, I don't even use VE anymore as, yeah. as a term in I our vernacular. It, it also uh, ended up being a number that was thrown out there that was not well-defined a lot of times. And so then are we realizing all the savings that we were supposed to, and maybe it's two or three iterations until we get yeah. that right. right. Um, and sometimes it was a fictitious number because they didn't know ABC when they came up with that number. And so oftentimes those meetings are so brief in terms of the decision making, it's a number on a spreadsheet to get down yeah. to right. another bottom line number. And nobody really knows the f- entire impact of those those decisions yeah. because oftentimes they were, okay, 
electrician, you give me this. Mechanical, you give me this. Nobody talks. We all just put it in a list, and then we go, okay, here's the numbers, yay or nay. And that's exactly how those conversations happen. And then in the end, we're like, well, yeah, it saved the electrician 50000 bucks, but it just cost the mechanical, you know, uh, 100000 or stuff yeah. like that. So you're not actually, in reality, you're not actually getting anywhere. The next pricing update comes in, and you're like, Yep. Why didn't we save fifty thousand dollars here? Right. What happened? That's, and yeah. we did everything on that VE list, and magically yep. something's not off. And yeah, so, you know. so we're back to redesign or putting things exactly. in that we just took out, yeah. right? It's the, the downstream right. impact and those yeah. unintended consequences. Yeah. yeah, and all and and still the end date stays the same, and so right. we've got to redesign it all now. You know, I had a a project uh, that years ago we, um, you know incorporated all of the value engineering items on it. And at 50% CDs, the decision was made to eliminate an entire air system. And this is in a hospital. And so had to redesign everything at 50% CDs. And it was a complete nightmare, you know, Mm -hmm. and I can tell you, I don't feel like that was value. Now I would have been glad to do that at the DD phase when it should have had that conversation. Um, and that would have been a natural iterative process that is what design is. But boy, when you do it too late, then it just causes so much problems. And, you know, I've I've seen owners start asking what it was your, you get awarded a job, right? A lot of times we get awarded jobs at hundred percent DD, Sam at risk works, what Mm -hmm. Flinko does. And I've seen owners, sophisticated owners ask, what was your DD number? And then what was the final contract? Yeah. And looking for a percentage point. And mm-hmm. if that percentage point is 5% lower, they're like, you guys didn't do your job during the during the estimating phase or during the pre-con phase. And it's, um, I got asked that question in an interview a couple months ago. And I was kind of like, I'm glad we were within 1% because that would have been pretty embarrassing to say, oh yeah, we gave back 5% to the owner. And they're sitting there going, well, what did you cut out of that job? Mm-hmm. What are you going to cut right. out of our job if that doesn't come mm-hmm. around? Yep. Ed, how is the percentage point uh, when you think about close percentage at DDs and at final contract on the uh, really the project you're working on right mm-hmm. now? Is is one percent kind of a big margin, or is it little? Or it is. We're within a quarter of a percent. Wow. We've been able to keep it there through um, you know through uh, through COVID and through a lot of escalation, and it's just by working as a team, right? Keep hitting those targets, making adjustments, uh, not cheapening the project, but we've been able to hit it. Uh, you know, because because the team is committed to it, because mm-hmm. we talk about it in literally every meeting um, and we're committed to it. We've, we've stayed within a quarter of a percent. That's planning for success, right? That's, That's right. That's probably music to the owner's ears, right? Hopefully the owner's listening yeah. today or saying, <laughs> golly, this sounds like a great team, right? Yeah. Where are they at? Oh, they're in Denver. Cool. We can find them to do a job for us. So, I mean, that's definitely the, ho- the whole point of today is to really talk about what the value is, the overall value for really the owner and then also the team, right? And we end up mm-hmm. getting to the end of a project we're proud of how it turned out. We're happy that we're, we hit the budget line. We hit the uh, completion date like everybody thought. And it's, and we walk out going, hey, we can do another job together. Like yeah. the owner, there's a chance the owner's going to hire us again, right? Yeah. It's going to be successful. Absolutely. So at Flinko, we're really big on safety, right? And we were talking about this, this curse word, VE. I'm not even going to say it now <laughs> after what we've talked about it. When we think about safety, how does that process impact safety uh, on a project? Yeah, from a design perspective, um, we think about safety in operations Mm -hmm. um, specifically. And, you know, if you design too much equipment in too small of a room, then that's an unsafe place to do the work and and oftentimes poorly maintained and those sorts of things. Sometimes we make decisions early in the design process on the electrical side that have high impacts to arc flash and those sorts of things that are um, major safety components. And so I think um, weaving safety into the design process is an important conversation as well Mm -hmm. to really drive that out and make it not only a beautiful, fully functional building, but it can actually be maintained and can uh, maintain its high performance at the end. 
Edward, do you have something to add there? I, I, I do. So part of the uh, target value design and pre-construction process are the charrettes that I talked about. And the charrettes, we focus on safety. Uh, by way of example, when we were working on the facade, the decision was made to use um, unitized curtain wall. And we mm-hmm. looked at how that could be installed more safely than stick built. Mm-hmm. Or uh, on the facade of the building, we have ACM metal panels that would go on a light gauge metal framing. But we determined that we could do that in the shop, right? They could be gusseted and installed so we don't have someone on the side of the building installing all these small pieces of light gauge metal framing. It can be done quicker, you know, more safely. It's doing, uh, being done in a fabrication shop. So uh, we look at that, the installation of equipment, right? You mentioned um, arc flashing, but we look at the installation of equipment, the space that we have. Um, to some, if something could be changed, it can be installed more safely. Mm-hmm. Or... Uh, uh, prefabrication, right? So that we're doing more offsite fabrication and bringing it in, doing less work at height. So uh, it's a really big focus for us during those charrettes and throughout the design process. Absolutely. Mackenzie, do you have anything to add? I've got to look through my lens of life safety. Um, okay. I think if you're talking about value engineering, and this is pretty drastic, but it does happen where we're actually charged with reducing square footage for the cost mitigation. Well, the life safety plans are designed in egress, for instance, and in ratings and in, in, um, how to defend in place. That strategy is designed early on in as, as early as SD. And if in later stages we're actually removing portions of the building or reducing square footage, that has to be redone completely across the entire floor and vertically uh, to ensure that egress has not been disturbed. Sometimes we're asked to downgrade in terms of uh, ratings, um, and, and that's, that complicates everything. So I, I think if, you know, we're, we're really trying to make huge strides in cost reduction and we're reducing scope, you're actually at risk of missing something that's really a non-negotiable and should remain in place. Who would have ever thought TVD could impact safety? But it turns out it does. Are there closing thoughts, Mark, any closing thoughts on TVD and what you want to leave the listeners with? Oh, boy. Um, Y'all be thinking, I'm going to ask y'all too. So Mackenzie and Ed, y'all are on deck. (laughs) We we covered a lot of, hey, I can't do that, can I? No. Um, We covered a lot of great stuff here. So uh, I guess in summary, I would say that um, if your project's not doing that or if you're not setting up your contracts to execute a project like that, I'd highly encourage you to try it. Um, I found it to be a superior way to execute projects and execute work. And I think it's, it gives you the granular decision making that's required for, um, for complex projects for Mm -hmm. sure. And, um, it, it breaks down those silos between, you know, uh, the different swim lanes, you know, uh, you're a mechanical engineer, so you're only going to talk about this with these people. And, and we're, we're getting to use the best talents of everybody in the room when we do that. So I, I, I'm all for it. So, um, Mackenzie, what about you? I think what we're just talking about is culture. It's a culture shift. It's, yeah. it's the yes. design and engineering and construction teams culture of how we deliver work. And it all starts with the RFP. Mm. I think that is a big change. I think that we need to start to see planning for and asking for and expecting target value design as, um, uh, as the, as the place to start, the the place to jump off and to make sure that you've got the right partners that can actually deliver on that promise. Um, that would be, that's way better than ditto. (laughs) <laughs> way was better. It, was it way better than what you said, though? <laughs> She's so competitive. I love it. <laughs> no, well, definitely not. I love what you said about <laughs> it starting. I love what you said about it starting at the RFP because when you hear this, you say, "Hey, this is a more concerted pre-construction effort from everybody's perspective." Yeah. But the pre-construction cost is peanuts compared to where you're going to end up on the tail end, yeah. right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Brother Ed, what do you have? Commit to, thoughts. Yeah, commit to the process. And what that really means is commit to the people, commit to your partners and live it. It works. It's not always easy, but it works and it's fun. You'll get success, but commit, commit to the process, commit to the people and work it. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. It was great to hang out. Great to talk. And uh, hopefully our listeners are enlightened by what we had to say today. So 
Thanks for coming out. Looking forward to the next job with you all. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. You bet. Thanks,